Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 391 for the 17th of March, 2015. Happy St. Patty's Day, everybody. Happy St. Patty's Day. Hello, and welcome to the show. Hey, tonight, you don't want to miss out. We are going to be continuing our series on how to create the most spectacular, amazing video slideshow from our still images. And tonight, we're going to get into the animation portion, so you don't want to miss out. Stick around. That's coming up on the show. In the meantime, over to Sasha Dermatis in the newsroom. Hey, Sasha. Hello. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. The process of machining the fastest wheels in automotive history has begun. A twice-issued Microsoft Windows patch is still causing pain for users, with some claiming the fix is triggering continuous reboots. For a short time Thursday, people all over the world were trying to access Google services and they were cut off because of a routing leak from an Indian broadband internet provider. You'll never guess which gaming company is launching into the smartphone gaming industry. And a 3D printing process based on Terminator 2 has been demonstrated at the TED conference and it's definitely not science fiction. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name's Robbie Ferguson. And my name's Erica Lalonde. Erica, it's, how have you been? It's good. Yeah, it's good? <laughs> it's it's definitely good. definitely good. It's been a while? It has been a while. You are kind of decked out for the, uh, yeah. she's, she's got the decoration behind her head, but there it is. <laughs> I, uh, I've been working on growing this in and, uh, and dyeing her green. So there you go. It's all real. We couldn't really go all out like Sasha Dermata. No. Sasha actually built an entire room made of green. My green desk, my green wall. I know. I it's know. great. Don't you all love it? It's kind of crazy. <laughs> if only she wore a green shirt. I have a green, I have one green hand. Okay. Can you see that? And does it kind of, Can, oh, it it's show? actually see-through. Nice. That's amazing. Put it over your left the left side of your head there. There. Yeah, you there can kind of see the... Yeah, the sky. There we go. Hands. I'm see-through. That's really that's a good creepy. Idea. Yeah, yeah that's... I mean, if you were to actually like douse yourself in green paint and just run around like carrying things and yeah. stuff. Well, I, I yeah. have green makeup that I usually wear on St. Patrick's Day, and I came so close to putting green eyeshadow on. How creepy would that <laughs> have been? Every time I blinked, there and, like, Every time she blinks, in my eyes. <laughs> just see through into <laughs> the world behind her, the city of Barrie, that is, <laughs> behind, uh, behind Sasha. Well, hey, everybody. I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased with the way that uh, our series is coming together mm -hmm. on creating these slideshows. We're going to be uh, touching on that tonight. Uh, welcome to our chat room just to give real quick shouts out to uh, those of you who are joining us tonight nice to see everybody from all around the world if you're new here hey i mean join us in the chat room category five on free node what do you say and uh, also say hi to us let us know where you're watching from uh if you're you know if you if, if it's you're somewhere new. just around the corner extravagant you know it's always nice to know where our viewers are watching from sometimes we try to read off the countries and my pronunciation does not work sometimes. Sometimes it's tough. I mean, <laughs> it's cause tough. Th we have viewers from all over the world. And it's and amazing fact, to it, see it. And it's been growing. We've been, we've been monitoring. I don't know if you watch the status page. Go to status.category5.tv. Pretty cool to see as people are watching the show where you're watching from and things like that. But you can also see the monthly averages and you know how many people are actually watching the show. And to realize that uh, almost a quarter of a million people per mm. week 
are tuning into Category 5 Technology TV uh, to our network uh, is, is really a wonderful thing. And I appreciate that so many of you have taken to the show and, and kind of made this your community. And, and we love having you here. Um, so make sure you pop into our chat room and say hi and let us know if you're new. Uh, we'd love to, to give shouts out to you. And you can also register on our website, category5.tv. What's this? I should do an episode on watching Category 5 on a cell phone. <laughs> we- an entire episode? <laughs> <laughs> this is coming into us from you the chat You know what? Room. I had trouble the first time, too. Yeah? It's, yeah. it's a tough thing because of the technology. Because I was, I was on the bus. I'm like, I'm going to watch the show. And then on a and- bus. That's the world we live in. I'm on a bus. I'm going <laughs> like, to watch Category 5 TV. Was it live you were trying to watch? You can yeah. watch On Demand easily enough. Go to our mobile it site. It was live. I just wanted to, you know, be like, hey, but then you can't see me, but still, hey. Yeah, but the people and around you would think you're weird, which <laughs> yeah. is cool. Well, I love it's that. A Every smaller time I audience. answer my phone and I have a little head for the microphone in, and I'm just like, hey, and then someone jumps on the bus and they think I'm crazy, but that's okay. <laughs> you're showing, I'm on this show. I'm I'm on this show and then like, mm-hmm. just show just people. They kind of move to the back of the bus and that's all good. Yeah. <laughs> bus life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, maybe we could do that in the future. There for, you go. You know, some it is sometimes challenging. I had a little I sometimes have challenges too. Yeah. The host. The How about you? How do you watch Category Five? I love uh, that we've got a growing viewership on the mm. Roku platform. I think Roku is is really where it's at when it comes to set top boxes, the ability to watch um, shows on your TV um, in a sane way. I guess in a like cable TV replacement kind of way, if you mm-hmm. will, uh, because it really makes it feel like you're watching TV versus having an internet set top box or something like that, mm. where it's basically just the internet. It really feels you like TV. You don't have to upkeep with the cable boo. Yes, <laughs> just the internet bill. Oh my. Unlimited. How was the uh, the skiing season? Because I'm I'm noticing you know that it, everything is melting now. I'm sure the ski hills <laughs> yeah. are still pretty good, but we haven't seen you around here for a bit. I know uh, yeah. you, you you were teaching again this year, were you? Yeah, yeah, I was teaching. I had a great season. Good, good. It was it was really nice. Like it was just I didn't do every weekend like I normally do. Um, just because I've been so busy with work and um, I've been doing it every other weekend. This is my last weekend this weekend. This is it, eh? This, this is my last everything, weekend. It, it, like, it was like a switch being flipped. It's the just snow like, is melted. Yeah, the snow we went from there, like six feet of snow to zero. It's gone. It's yeah. very. All the fish huts coming quick. in off the, off the ice. Yeah. Mm. It's very quick. And, you know, surprisingly, like I was teaching uh, not last weekend, but the weekend before. And. I, it was February, the Valentine's Day weekend, it was negative 40. Minus 40 negative Celsius. Celsius, not just like That's minus Fahrenheit. 40 Fahrenheit. Yeah, like it Think was about that. negative 40. That's trippy. And negative 30, <laughs> negative 35, three days straight, I'm teaching. And, and you're out on the slopes in that weather? Yeah. That's brutal. Every other ski hill. And I'm not too sure, Adam, if you, you, because Adam also works at Snow Valley too. And, and I'm not too sure if he was in tubing, but you were standing out there and the kid's cold and I'm like complaining more than the kid. And I'm <laughs> You're like, out there longer than home. they are. I yeah. want to go home. <laughs> and then two weeks later, it's just like I was skiing in my sweater, got my sunglasses on. I'm just like chilling, having a great time. Such a complete 360 in just a week and a like half. That. It was like to overnight. Negative 40 to plus one in a week and a half. Plus something like 13 yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Ha, spring is upon us, my <laughs> friends. Wonderful. And I guess St. Patrick's Day is a surefire uh, introduction to spring because that's, that's about where it starts. So welcome. Yeah. Shall we get into it? You saw last week's episode, Erica? Yes. You saw it? Yes. If you didn't, you can't do stop part this two video without now. part one. You got to go back you to part one. It. You got to know what we're doing <laughs> here, folks. Uh, because what we're doing, we're creating the ultimate video slideshow out of your still photographs. We're doing that using as much as possible. And so far, I've been able to pull it off. We're using free tools on Linux. Sweet. <laughs> but what if I don't have Linux, Robbie? That's the question you were about to ask, right? Oh. 
What if I, I don't do have, have it? It's not the worst. What if I don't have Lennox? <laughs> Just ask for their sake. What if I don't have Lennox? <laughs> what a great question, Erica. Is that leading the, the questions a little bit? I yeah, guess so, yeah, right? that's like if, good. I, if this was a court of law, that would have been. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah hey. Uh, that's pretty good. If you don't have Linux, what's cool about it, you can get a, uh, a, a live CD, which means you can actually boot up from a CD or a USB flash drive and use the operating system for free without even having to install it. Which is awesome. Yeah. Or if you've got a Windows computer and you want to do what's called a dual boot, uh, which, you know, quite often we do that if you still need Windows for something. You can actually boot, you can install it in such a way alongside of Windows so that you can turn on your computer and you get a menu. Do you want Windows or do you want Linux? Choose which one. You go into Linux to do the stuff that we're doing tonight. And of course, everything that we're learning, if you're a Windows user, if you're on Mac and you don't want to switch, everything that we're learning, the, the processes, the abilities, the techniques are the same. Just the tools that we're using are freely available on the Linux operating system. So, um, but if it's it's for you, even if you don't have these tools or if you don't have access to them, that's uh, because you're on a different platform. That's fine. But I want you to know that you can get it absolutely free as well and add it to your system. Uh, but uh, all right. Ready to go? We're going to use a different tool tonight. Now, last week, you remember, we were looking at using the GNU image manipulation program to create uh, layers from our photographs. So let's actually bring that up so that I can basically pick up where we left off last week. So I've got the original file here of... The kids. My darling kids. Just loading up into GNU image manipulation program. There we go. So last week, you remember what we did, and I haven't touched this since, just so that we could pick up right where we left off. You'll notice that, okay, there's the picture that we, that's kind of the picture that we started with. There's when I've pulled out most of the background. Now you see there are still a couple of things. And here's the background without the kids in it. So you're going to need to learn how to do this stuff. So go back to the, uh, the first part of this series at category5.tv and you'll be able to pick up where we are. Okay, so tonight let's just turn off the back layer here and let's get in here just a little bit and we're just going to kind of finish this thing off. It's so easy at this point because what is a, a bench? It's basically straight edges, right? It's so easier. I can get in here and I can just grab this and I'm getting kind of sloppy with it, but you know what? You're going to take just a bit more time because you're not doing a presentation live on web TV, <laughs> you can kind of make sure that your lines are just right. Git makes it really, really easy, though. I'm using the same tools that I did last week, and I'm just pulling out that bit of the layer there. And I'm just hitting Control-X to delete that. You can also use layer masks if you prefer, but because we've made a backup copy of our original layer, it's OK. And again, this was all covered on part one. Zipping over here. Look at that. OK, so it's a little bit more improved, and there's just that one section between the kids there where I need to get rid of this, and you're going to understand why that is in just a couple of moments' time. Look at that. So, Erica, do you understand the concept of parallaxing and what it is that we're intending to do with this? Yeah, it's basically to get um, the distance, like when you look out a window and the larger yes. objects um, are further... Well, they move slower versus the smaller objects in the foreground. And if you observe that, mm -hmm. you'll really, really start to see that when, when something appears three-dimensional that is two-dimensional mm -hmm. in video, th they're most likely using that parallaxing effect, whether it's synthetic or it's actually being you know, part of a film or something right. along those lines. Sometimes it's accent accentuated or even exaggerated by blurring the background and moving it at a different pace, things like that. Mm, correct, yeah. And basically we're just doing a synthetic, our own version of it. We didn't have the ability, we didn't have the chance to yeah. take these photos in a video form, so we're converting it to this so that we can do something that you normally wouldn't be able to do with a photograph. Which so, is really cool. I think so. And uh, you know I what? I thought it was a really good idea because you can definitely just take old photos and make it look even more interesting. And I it's very fairly simple to do. Love this for wedding photos. If you're a photographer, here are some methods that we're... And notice what I'm doing here. As I'm speaking, I'm just tracing out 
the grass that's falling into the background there. Oh, and that's actually part of the pole that's part of the bench. These techniques, as I say, can be, it, it doesn't matter what operating system or anything you're on, there you go. It's just the bench now. Look at that. Sweet. Turn that on the background, good. there you go. See that? So what I've effectively done is now if I move that top layer, notice the bleacher is completely separated from the grass and the flowers in the background. Okay, so that's, that's what we're looking for. So we can move things around a lot easier. Okay, so I'm gonna save my work. And I mentioned last week, but we didn't actually get into it, but when you're saving, we want to save as, and we're gonna save as an XCF file. This is akin to Photoshop's um, uh, PSD file, which is a layered document. So on GNU Image Manipulation Program, when you save an XCF, you're saving all those layers and all that information, all your masks and things like that, so that you can always go back to those layers and continue working on them like I did. So now that I've already saved, I can just hit Control S and it's going to save back over that file and you'll see that I still have my layers. If I was to save as a JPEG or a ping image, then I would lose all my layers and I would be back at square one and I would just have hmm. my original image basically because it would flatten that image. Okay, so now that we've basically fixed that up and it's ready to go, now the only thing that you know, is not quite perfect with that is you still see some of the bench. So using again some of the techniques that we uh, that we learned last week. We're going to get in there and switch my layer here and just kind of, oh, that's very, very tiny, isn't that? What is that, two pixels? <laughs> 20 <laughs> pixels. There's a bigger brush. I just want to get quick with it, so look at what I'm doing. Just painting over. We learned this technique last week, and what I actually am doing is filling in where the bleacher is with image data so it doesn't look synthesized or copied or anything because it, just it fills it in with real imagery there are more flowers there's more grass and now I've got that real look behind the bleachers see that mm -hmm. okay so if if I was really doing this uh, professionally say I was doing this for a client project or something like that I might even go so far as doing a third layer of depth and what I mean by that is I've got my background and I've got my foreground. However, with this image, it would work really, really well. See that pole there? That may, and this grass in the foreground and the flowers, they, may, they could make a really perfect second layer. See that pole and this grass? That would work really, really well. And then the very farthest would be the, the actual background. For the sake of time, we're doing two layers and we're still going to be able to create a very cool uh, effect with these two layers. So now that we're finished editing our photo, again, now I've done a little bit of manipulation, so I'm gonna save that. We need to consider what is next for this. We're gonna be creating a video, so we're gonna be creating probably a widescreen video, something for 1080p, let's say, or 720p. So we need to know the dimensions of those. So uh, 1920 by 1080, pixels is going to be the dimensions of a, uh, a 1080p video. So we want to now crop this image to not be that size, because remember, we're going to be zooming in on it. So if we, if we create this image at the size we're going to be creating, then as we zoom in, we're going to be getting lossy zoom. We're going to be pixelating the image. We're stretching it, basically. So instead, because our source image here is 4,800 pixels wide or somewhere around there, 4,900 pixels wide comes from a, a reasonably good DSLR camera. So what I want is I just want the proportions. I just want to have that 16 over 9. That is achieved by simply right-clicking on the image and going image canvas size. And you see, okay, so I am 4,928 by 3,264. Well, how do I now get that to be proportional to 1,280 by 720 or 1,920 by 1,080? It's surprisingly simple. Make sure this chain link is detached. And if our image is wider than it is, uh, than it is high, then we're gonna copy the width. Okay, if it's the other way around, we might, well, well, we'll think about this proportionally, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy the width for this particular image because I'm actually going to be cropping it. If you wanna know, Type in 1280 and see that it's higher than 720 for the height. If that's less than 1280, then you know that you actually want to copy the height. 
or pardon me, if it's less than 720. So for example, if I go 720, I see that this one is less, right? So if that was the case, I hope that makes sense. Uh, basically, our end result needs to not have, let's, let's show you a demonstration here. Uh, let's say 1280 by 720. And if I created this at, what was my original dimension? So I just want to show you what we want to avoid. 1280, 720, there. Okay, so what has happened there, because I copied the height, is that I've now got Oh. a little extra space on either side. That's what we want to avoid, okay? I'm trying to explain that in, in words. It's a little bit <laughs> difficult, and I'm just realizing this as I go. Uh, so, okay, so what I know is that I need to actually copy the width. The width is the one that we're going to use our, for our proportion. So now that I've got that in my clipboard, I can go, I can do 1280 by 720, and then turn on my chain link, because all I'm doing is I'm getting that, that 16 over 9 for 720p, doesn't matter, because if I change that to 1080p, look at what happens to the top, it changes to 1920. Perfect. So now if I hit uh, Control V and paste in my width, 4928, now as soon as I hit Tab, it has created a height that is exactly proportional to, 12, uh, to 1280 by 720 or 1920 by 1080, right? because I've got this chain link on. So now my crop looks like this. And see, it's going to crop the image, so I just want to center the kids in that image. And as soon as I resize, now this image is exactly 16 over 9, even though it is 4,928 pixels wide. So now that I've done that, if I turn back on the chain link, watch what happens if I go 1280. 720 is the height. If I go 1920, 1080 is the height because I've created a proportional image to the 16 over 9 frame. Okay. Okay. It's a little, I, I, I hope that that makes sense. I know it's a little bit complicated, but really what we want to end up with is a cropped image to the 16 over 9 frame so that we're not going to be letterboxing. And that means when I put this into a video, we don't get black bars on the side. That's what we want to avoid. So this is now exactly 16 over 9. So now I can go file, and you know what? I don't want to do that yet. I want to turn off my top layer, and I just want to save my background. So I'm going to go file, export, and let's create a folder here for our animation. And we're going to call this one background.ping. And export. Ping is going to be lossless as far as the quality of the image goes. It also supports transparency, so it's definitely important that we use ping for the foreground layer. Otherwise, it's just going to have a, back, uh, a white background. But it's not we could use a JPEG for the background because there is no alpha layer, but we're going to lose some quality if we, if we do that because JPEG is a lossy format, so it's, it's not going to have quite as good of quality. And when we are working with such high resolution, it can be apparent. So you see it does take a little bit longer to save the ping because it is quite large. So now if I turn off my background and I turn on my foreground, now I've got just the picture of the kids, which is going to be on top of that. So now I'm going to file, export, and we're going to call this one foreground. And you can call it absolutely anything you want. But just for the sake of me understanding <laughs> what these images are, that's the way I'm going to name them. So I'll just bring up that folder as that's finished saving, and I've created a folder called Animation, and in that folder you'll see Background, I'm going to just double click on it, and Next Image, Foreground, and that's what it looks like when the, the image preview adds a background of white. So that is going to be the basis of our new animation, which we are covering tonight. We're going to take that photograph and we're going to create a really cool parallaxing video effect uh, for our slideshow. This is going to achieve something that, that kind of Ken Burns moving around the image. Uh, and, I, and I use Ken Burns as, as um, a description that is used for that effect. I'm not saying Ken Burns himself or his movie making. <laughs> but that effect where we're moving around an image and, and moving yeah. in and out of our slideshow images, it's really, really cool. But what we're doing today and over the course of this three-part series, this is part two, 
we're actually creating such a, a three-dimensional parallaxing effect that it's going to give it much more of a video look to that slideshow, to that effect. Not just moving around on an image, but moving within a space. So that's what we're going to be covering right after the news tonight. So stick around. Make sure you are in the chat room, Category 5 on Freenode. And if you've got any questions for us, make sure you post those to us there. And uh, Erica is watching the chat room as well as email live at Category5.tv. So heading on over to the Category5.tv newsroom, Sasha. Hello. It's Tuesday, March 17, 2015, and here are the stories we're covering this week. Wheels designed to take a car to a top speed of 1,000 miles per hour are being manufactured. A fix that breaks everything has once again been issued by Microsoft and affects mainly users who dual boot their Windows system. Imagine if the mistake of a single ISP could accidentally take down Google for the entire world. They can, and they did. Huge gaming news for Nintendo fans. And Carbon 3D is pushing innovation in 3D printing with the demonstration of their game-changing process, which prints items in 10 minutes that would normally take 10 hours. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. If you would like to have your very own chroma key green screen set, whether it's to celebrate this St. Patrick's Day or to have a cool virtual set like our Category 5.tv newsroom, head on over to cat5.tv slash green where you'll find all the green screen sets are currently on sale up to 56% off. I'm Sasha Dermatis and here are the top stories from the Category 5.tv newsroom. The process of machining the fastest wheels in automotive history has begun. The aluminum discs will be fitted to the Bloodhound supersonic car, which will endeavor to break the world land speed record later this year. That record currently stands at 736 miles per hour. Castle Engineering near Glasgow is leading the industrial consortium that is preparing the wheels. These 90 centimeter discs are a crucial element of the Bloodhound concept and will have to endure huge loads as they spin at over 170 revolutions per second. Oh. Yeah, calculations indicate that at peak speed, the wheels will be generating 50,000 radial Gs at their rim. That's 50,000 times the pull of gravity. These, there are parts of this car where if there's a problem, the driver, Andy Green, can simply shut them off and bring the vehicle to a stop. But if there's a problem with a wheel, Andy is going to crash. And uh, that's never good at 1,000 miles per hour. Bloodhound has, to, Bloodhound has to use solid wheels to make the record run. A rubber tire would be ripped to shreds. That makes sense. Ripped to shreds instantly. <laughs> Once machined, the discs will go for balancing. Unlike a standard car wheel, this does not involve adding lead weights to the rim. Instead, further precision measurements will identify any unevenness and a sliver of metal will be removed to hone what is already a state of near perfection. The market value of each wheel is about a quarter of a million pounds, a little over 370,000 US dollars. Seeing at the uh, speed limit here is 120, oh no, 100. Uh, uh, <laughs> 120, yeah. 100 kilometers an hour. We won't need these tires anytime soon. <laughs> Robbie, that's incredible. Wow, that is frightening. I would be, I would be so intimidated by that speed. I don't know what kind of person would want a crazy oh. adrenaline seeker. I guess, yeah, Absolutely. that's just not me. I mean, I grew up and decided I would go into computer programming. Yeah, you're not going to drive a car <laughs> at 1,000 miles per hour. No. I guess they use aluminum because it doesn't heat up. Is that That's probably... like You think I about like, the revolutions per second. Those, even the, even though they're aluminum, they're still going to be incredibly warm to touch, I'm sure. Oh, my goodness, yes. And <sighs> I would think, though, also, I mean, aluminum is, uh, this is solid aluminum, right? But mm. uh, I would think that at that speed, with that much G-force going down on the, the, the wheel, or is it out? out There's got to be right? some kind of expansion going <sighs> on. Like, that's... What's his name? Andy that's Green? Crazy. He's a brave man. <laughs> Very... Wow. Brave slash crazy. Okay. This is an important news story for 
um, anybody who's dual booting right now. Reports are emerging that a twice issued Microsoft Windows 7 patch is still causing pain for users, with some claiming the fix is triggering continuous reboots. The patch was first issued as KB2949927 and withdrawn in October due to system faults, before being re-released this week under the new name KB3033929. Sporadic reports across internet forums suggest the patch is causing pain on the Windows system systems, especially PCs that boot into two or more operating systems. Redmond's initial hope was that the, the patch would bring SHA-2 or SHA-2 code signing support for Windows 7 and Server 2008 R2 users whose operating system did not previously include that functionality. It seems sensible to avoid the update until Microsoft confirms the problem and provides a fix for the fix. So, Robbie, that would affect our viewers who have a dual boot with, like, Windows 7. Yeah, from what I understand, I mean, they're saying if it's dual boot environments or multiple boot environments. So if you have Windows 7 and you're dual booting with Linux, for example, or multiple Linux partitions and you have Windows 7 installed and you get that update, it could botch the right. ability to boot up that system. So don't update. It's not the first time recently that we've had these kinds of, you know, fixes that break everything. Um, which is, you know, it's a little bit worrisome for a Windows user. You know, you expect that those fixes, when they're released, are tried and true, and they're not going to break things, but instead are going to fix things. And I guess we take it for granted on Linux, even though we do get our updates for all of the programs, It's if we're using a stable distro, it's quite honestly stable. So we don't generally have those kinds of breakages. I guess it does happen even on Linux, though, once in a while, but it seems to be happening more and more on Windows. Definitely a scary thing. So don't in any way use the fix yet. <laughs> That's a tough thing. Hey? It's like, <laughs> whatever you do, don't update, but always update. Don't update that update. <laughs> yes. Yes. And how do you know? And what do you do? You got to hold back your K KB updates. And yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a bit nightmarish. For a short time Thursday, people all over the world trying to access Google services were cut off because of what DIN Research Director of Internet Analysis Doug Mattery identified as a routing leak from an Indian broadband internet provider. The leak is similar to a 2012 incident caused by an Indonesian ISP which took Google offline for 30 minutes worldwide. Routing leaks occur when a network provider broadcasts all or part of its internal routing table to one or more peered networks via the border gateway protocol, causing network traffic to be routed incorrectly. In this case, the Indian ISP's router incorrectly announced routing data for over 300 network prefixes belonging to Google. These routes were then sent to the rest of the world and a number of ISPs accepted them. The ISP Hathaway had its own routes because to, or the ISP Hathaway had its own routes to Google because the company provides better speed to Google's cloud for its users, directing traffic to the closest Google data centers. That peering is a private network connection only available to users connected to their network. Oh. <laughs> Ouch. Yep. As a result, when the routing table was accidentally broadcast to the world instead of just to Hathaway's customers, much of the world was trying to access Google via Mumbai through Hathaway instead of over public internet. Wow. wow. So I wonder how long on Thursday it took before Google caught on and fixed it. Probably not long. They not would have the, noticed their traffic drop significantly. Like immediately, right? It's, you know, how quickly does the change to fix it propagate? Back. It would mm -hmm. take, I would think the, uh, I don't know if Hathaway would have to determine the problem and push out a, a fix or what would oh, happen at that point. I'm sure that Mr. Google was on the phone with Hathaway immediately. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> uh, we have a problem here, Houston. <laughs> you've broken the internet. You typed Google into Google and you broke the internet. <laughs> like Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Nintendo has finally succumbed to the market and is collaborating with Japanese developer DNA to create new games for smartphones. Wow. The, I know. The gaming giant said that existing games built for other Nintendo platforms like the Wii U and 3DS will not be transferred. However, all of Nintendo's intellectual property will be eligible for development. 
This could mean new games on the horizon featuring characters such as Super Mario, Zelda, and Pokemon. The two firms also announced plans to launch an online membership service this fall, which will give members access to their accounts from across multiple platforms, including smartphones and PCs. That's huge for Nintendo. Groundbreaking, even, when wow. you think about it. So, they, they've always held to the, you know, you've got to buy our hardware in order to, in order to like use it, right? Other people's hardware. Now, are we going to start seeing Samsung, you know, apps on Android and things like that? That's incredible. I could see it definitely moving to well, the apps, like just having Nintendo games on apps. Oh, that would be horrible for me because I really like Nintendo games. And on actual Nintendo devices? Well, I haven't played them in years. I had a Super Nintendo, which was a big deal for me, but yeah. I haven't played I don't have a Wii or anything. Okay. But I like downloading a phone to my or f- downloading a game to my phone that would be as a Addicting is Super Mario Brothers would be horrible. Yes, no, it would be wonderful. <laughs> wonderful, and it would be wonderful, but horrible. It's the it's amazing I, that I they have like finally that. said, okay, now like it's it, they're really late in the game. I gotta admit, like they're yeah, they are finally really saying, late. oh, the smartphone is going to become popular. Well, who's going out and buying a 3ds for themselves anymore? It's you know maybe some kids have it for sure, but. I'm not going out to buy one because you've got it on your. It's going to waste so much of my time. I know. I'm going to love it and I hate it all at once. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. A 3D printing process that harnesses light and oxygen has been demonstrated at the TED conference in Vancouver, Canada. 3D or Carbon 3D said its game changing process could make objects such as car parts, medical devices, or shoes. The technique was inspired by Terminator 2, which, in which the T-1000 robot rises from a pool of metallic liquid. James Woodcock, group editor for TCT Magazine, said, It's not unusual for huge claims like this to be made, but as it's renowned experts working on it, it gives it some gravitas. During their presentation, the Carbon 3D machine produced a plastic ball from a pool of resin in a, just about 10 minutes. Professor Joseph De Simone told the audience it would traditionally take up to 10 hours to print the same thing. That's impressive. Wow. If anything, the demonstration showed the need for companies in the industry to continually work on developing and improving 3D printing technology. That's great. I'm excited for that technology to come, come to light and make things more accessible all across the board. You could print really fast cars and put aluminum tires on them <laughs> and get everywhere faster than 100 kilometers an hour. <laughs> For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit the Category5.tv newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. For the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Thank you, Sasha. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. And I'm your co-host, Erica Lalonde. How are you? Nice to see you. We're in the midst of part two of creating the ultimate video slideshow from our still images. So right now we're going to get into the actual animation process. So far we have taken a flat 2D image and we have created two layers And I've mentioned you could create a third layer if you want to add even more to that effect. But Mm. for the sake of simplicity, we're going to work with two layers today. And we're still going to be able to create this incredible effect. So looking over at our computer screen, now I've got these two images. I've got background and foreground. We're done with the GIMP, so I can close that down. Goodbye. I have saved my work. Other than, what did I not save? I didn't save the cropping, right? Because the cropping is losing data. Yes. And I can always recrop. I don't want to save over top of my master image, which is larger, with something that I've cropped out some of the data. So I'm happy to lose that. Okay. So I'm going to go in and uh, just a reminder that OpenShot Video Editor is available for you for free. You can install it through Synaptic Package Manager or through uh, AptGet. You can install it through your favorite Uh, package manager. Maybe you run Yum or another alternative. Uh, Basically, the way Linux allows you to install software, you don't necessarily have to go out and find the software. You just bring up the uh, application that allows you to install things, such as Synaptic Package Manager. Type in the name, and uh, off you go. So type in OpenShot, 
all one word, and you're going to be able to install this application absolutely free, and this gives you the ability to, to edit video. But what we're doing tonight is completely different. We're going to create instead our first panoramic slideshow slide. So what I've done here, first thing I want to do is click on new and I want to create a project that is going to be, uh, let's say 1080p. So I'm going to go 29.97 frames per second because that is the uh, standard here in Canada. And I'm just going to save this as my slide, let's say, and hit save project. So what I've done is I've created a blank project. It is completely empty, but it's ready to work on and its canvas is 16 over 9, 1080p. Now all I need to do is import some files into this canvas and I've got those saved on my computer. I put them in a folder called animation. I've got background and foreground. There we go. I've clicked add. You notice that I was able to highlight both of them at the same time? Yeah. A couple ways to do that. Now the way I just did it was I clicked on the first one, held in my shift key, clicked on the second one, and it highlighted both. And you can highlight as many as you want. You can also hit control A to select all. Um, those hotkeys are pretty much across the board for anything. So I've got my background image and I've got my foreground image. So let's grab the background, which we're going to drop onto track one. You'll notice that we've already got two tracks here. And with the way that this works is track one becomes basically our background mm -hmm. and track two becomes our foreground because the okay. way that this video editor works is it is like layers. Right. So the lower the number, the lower the layer. So I can keep stacking things on top. And in fact, if I wanted to, I could continue to add more and more layers to okay. that or tracks in this case. Well, that's good. That gives people the opportunity if they need, if they need more layers. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're doing video production, it doesn't even necessarily have to be for what we're doing tonight. But if you're doing video production quite often, you're going to need to add more. And in fact, through the course, uh, through uh, part three of this series, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of the show tonight. But uh, we're going to be looking at adding things like music, for example. So we need another layer to be able to put that music in right. to our timeline. So That's good. It gives you that option. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty much unlimited as far as that goes. So for us, we just need the first two layers uh, or tracks. In this case, I've got my background dragged on there. And if I push play, you'll see that in my preview window, I literally just have the background plays as if it's a video. But it's not actually doing anything. Okay, so now I grab my foreground and I put that on top. And now if I rewind my video and press play, what do you notice? If I rewind my video and press play, it's the original. it looks like the original image, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Just like it. You'd never know that I pulled a bunch of stuff from the background. Okay, so now this is where it gets exciting because now we're going to actually animate this thing. You remember the Ken Burns effect. Okay, take a photo, move in on it, move it around, get that kind of effect, and then think about that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do this, a similar thing, but because we've got these two layers to work with, we can move them and scale them at different rates. Oh, remember parallaxing and how that yeah. works? So the background always moves a little bit slower than the Before. foreground when it comes to parallaxing. So here, let's grab my, my background. And first of all, it drops it in at seven seconds uh, by default. I've right-clicked on it and gone uh, properties. So first of all, I want to change my length, change out to 25 seconds. So now the background is actually going to take 25 seconds of my timeline. And that's probably a little more preferred. Okay, so now going back to properties here, this is where things get really exciting. I'm going to go to the layout tab and you see that the start of clip is height 100% and width 100%. Keep in mind that we've created this image to be exactly 16 over 9, so as it is, it fills, at 100%, it fills that 16 over 9 canvas. Okay, so from here, because the image is bigger than our canvas, we can zoom in and it's going to be lossless. So I can actually go now to my end of clip keyframe. So this is now saying, okay, well, what size, what position, what alpha do you want it to be at the end of the video, at the end of this 25 seconds? So at the end of clip, for my background, let's say 150%. I want the width and the height to be exactly the same. It needs to be proportional, otherwise it's going to look skewed. It's going to look stretched and I can go apply. So now if I push play, the background is going to start moving. 
See that? Ooh. But the kids in the foreground are still sitting stationary. And then they disappear because they're only seven seconds long. The background continues up to 25 seconds and keeps moving through the, the animation. What's really, really great about the way OpenShot is doing this is we're not saying I want one picture to be at 100% and I want another picture to be at 150%. What it's doing is, is it's tweening through or in between and it's filling every frame in between at 29.97 frames. Okay. It's filling in those frames with, okay, now how many steps do we need to have to make that a fluid motion? And it does that all automatically. So I don't have to create all of those frames like I might with some applications that don't tween the image. So It makes it easy. It makes it so <laughs> easy. You, you're not going to believe how easy this is. I, I know. Just by you doing that now, I'm like, this is going to be complicated. <laughs> you thought so, right? No, I did. Yeah. And this is like easy. This is going to be complicated and expensive. <laughs> oh, actually, it's easy and, and free. free. <laughs> All right. How do you like that? Okay. Soul patch included. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you watching this after the fact, yeah, it's St. Patrick's Day. So, yeah, that's, that's important to note. I'm not actually crazy. Okay. I've right-clicked on <laughs> foreground and gone properties, and you'll see, hey, what's going on? There's the kids, and there's no background, right? So that's because it's a ping. We've created it with a transparent background. I'm going to now set the length to out 25 seconds. So now it matches the length of my background. We think in terms of uh, it's a picture, but now it's actually becoming a video. So if I now say, okay, end of clip for this is also going to be 150%, then when I apply that and press rewind and play, you'll notice that it's the traditional Ken Burns effect. It's just moving in on the image. That's kind of what we're saying when I use the phrase Ken Burns. That's more along the lines of what your, let's say, your application uh, may be capable of. When you think about CyberLink PowerDirector and its ability to move in on images, it looks great, but it's limited to that unless you take what we've shown you in step one. And then we can take it to the next level. So you see that effect? That's, that's what we're... Cool. That, that's the original. That's how we're used to doing slideshows. Now we're taking it to the next step because we're saying, you know what? Let's change the background so that it moves at a different pace. So our background we know is going to end up at 150. Why don't we say our foreground will actually end up at 200%? What do you think is going to happen then? Oh, I'm bad with math. I don't know. Our foreground is going from 100%, so this size, to this size, 200%. So twice as big. So it's going to go bigger. However, the background is starting at 100% and mm -hmm. only going up to 150. So it's not getting as big. So as far as, because remember, this program is tweening for us, which means it's filling in those frames in between mm -hmm. frame one, our keyframe at the beginning, and frame two, our keyframe at the end. So it fills all that in. So how it gets from here to here takes 25 seconds. But how our foreground gets from here to here also takes 25 seconds. So we know that the foreground is in fact going to be moving a fair bit faster right. than our background. Okay. Oh, so, so different speeds. Different yeah. speeds, right. We're looking at percentages, but we're actually looking at speed. And of course, how close we get. So I've set now, our background is 150, our foreground is 200. Let's hit rewind and see what happens. Let's hit play. Interesting. See that? Okay, that's pretty cool. How cool is that? So now we need to do a little bit of work in order to make it so that it looks more like a video and we want to keep the kids in the frame. See how Zach is getting cut off there? My son on the right. Oh, no. 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 Bring him back. Bring him back. Okay, so <laughs> what we want to do is we want to bring up our foreground and let's say with the foreground at our end of clip keyframe, let's grab our X, which is the horizontal axis, and go minus 40%. Our Y, so that's the vertical mm. axis, axis, pardon me, if I go up, the camera is going to move up, which means the kids are going to move mm. down, down because the camera is moving up on the image. Oh. If I move to a lower number or a negative number, it's mm. going to move down. Okay. So they're going to actually, the camera is going to move down and keep them centered in the frame. So what I want to do is, of course, go down. So let's do a similar number. Let's try minus 40, minus 40, and see what happens there. So now, 
hitting play. Okay, so now you see that that doesn't work with the background because the, our background is still moving at its normal pace. But the kids are doing what? They're staying centered, mm -hmm. which is important because they're my subjects. Now, f minus 40, I was lucky that I guessed the right number. That looks That's about perfect. That's pretty good. Yeah, um, you may need to tweak that a little bit. So now I need to work with the background and say, okay, we want to also move that in a similar fashion. So the end of clip is going to be minus let's say minus 30. Let's try minus 30 and minus 30. So that's moving the camera down a little bit. You know, I don't want to go down quite so much. And left a little bit. I'm going to try 30. I think that might be a little bit much. Let's try. Oh, that's actually, it's looking pretty decent. You have okay. the best guesses. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> that looks pretty neat, eh? So yeah. you see what's happening to that pole in the background? It's, it's ending up going behind Zach. Because I'm actually moving the camera through this space. So it gives that kind of feel that I am actually moving through this mm -hmm. photograph. Total. So it's not just zooming in on a photograph and everything still stays, you know, that pole is still way over there. No, it actually seems to move in a parallaxing We're way. Going through time. And space. <laughs> okay, so I'm pretty pleased with the way that that has come out, but you yeah. notice it's kind of choppy. Yeah. What do you do? It's a little bit choppy. My what video's do you choppy. Do? <laughs> Here we are. We're in Linux, so we know that you know it's really, really uh, easy to check our versioning and stuff. What OpenShot uses is something called uh, MLT. And it comes from a package called Melt. So if I type Melt dash dash version, you'll see that my version of Melt, or MLT, is 0 0.8.8. .8. I want you to do that same thing in your Linux. If you don't have Melt, just go sudo apt-get install Melt, and you're good. If it is over 0 0.8, uh, pardon me, if it is over 0 0.6, you're going to be able to do what I'm about to show you, and that's going to be uh, incredible for you. So. I'm going to zoom out here. I'm good because I know I'm above 0 0.6. Now I'm going to go Edit, Preferences, and right here, Use Smooth Scaling. Because I know I have version 0 0.6 or above, I can set that to Yes. Okay? And then I can close out of that. My preview window is, is going to be a little bit laggy now because I'm using something that's going to be using a lot more resources. But now when I render my video, and this is the key thing, when... Typically, when you export your video, if you haven't set your smooth scaling to yes, it's going to be ch as choppy as we were seeing there in our preview. So now that we've created the effect, we've turned on smooth scaling, we've confirmed that Melt, MLT, is version 0 0.6 or above, let's export our file and see what it looks like. So that's really, really easy to do as well. File, export video. And what we're doing in that case, Erica, is we're in fact creating a video file, one that we can share on Facebook or oh, YouTube okay. or something like that. So let's say web. So it doesn't same, save as an image. It's basically. not images. It's not, yeah, it's an actual video file. Oh, that's shareable, which is also good because sometimes you yeah. do stuff and you want to make sure you can share it. That's it too. And, <laughs> yeah. But these days, because we're working within a HD video space, yeah. you have to upload it to something like YouTube or Facebook in order to share it. YouTube is good because then you can post it to Facebook and you can also send links to family and friends and things like that. So that works well. Um, I've just simply chosen Flickr HD 720p. You notice that it doesn't go any higher than that, but you can go into advanced and you can set your height and you know you can do whatever you want. So we can go all the way up to 1080p or possibly, I guess that's that looks like about where it goes. So in our case, I want to keep it real quick, so I'm just going to create a 720p file and export it to my desktop. Let's see if we can render that out fairly quickly for the sake of the demonstration. Here it comes. Any questions for us? Join us in the chat room, Category 5 on Freenode. And uh, yeah, that's uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun to be able to do this kind of stuff. And next mm. week we're going to be, I, I touched on what we're going to be doing. And as this is rendering, I'll just let you know. Uh, we're going to be taking these clips that we have now created and we're going to be able to assemble these into an actual slideshow with 
nice transition effects, and then render them out to a video that we can share, including music and all the, uh, all the fixins. So we're going to be able to have that final uh, rendered product. It's just taking a second. Right. While, this, uh, while this is rendering, Erica, do you have any questions for me? Robbie, I have a quick... Yeah. I just need, before the episode is over, for you and your awesome green beard soul patch to come over to the green screen to just join just you so on that the we green can screen see set. exactly what it can looks we, like well you know what i'll do is i'll bring up um you since, jump in there now just gonna jump, <laughs> 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 jump while we're while we're waiting while for this to render it's about 40 percent minutes okay it's, so, it, you've been starting up some talk in the newsroom all night about your soul patch yeah, yeah. Okay, there's well, been chatter if if we jump over there then we can we can actually still see on your screens there, Sasha, what, uh, what kind of progress we're making. Okay. Right? So that's oh. pretty. Oh, smart, right? <laughs> okay, so let's see what happens when. <laughs> so I'll move out of the way. Oh, really? Sh are you just going to stay here with me? I'll just kind of creep in. Can okay. I creep in? Yeah. What? Can you? you uh, hi. So let's see. The, does it disappear? Does can, it disappear? Can, can, can we zoom in? I have no clue. <laughs> if you click on the shot, you can. Okay, so click on... <laughs> Is it weird? I have to just sneak away here. You can... I just want to see... Hi, folks. Oh, that's so... It turns Is that really black. creepy? Oh, it and your, your shirt goes a little um, translucent kind of as well. Cream. Yeah. Wow. That's chroma key. Oh, no, it's not black. It's really like the city behind you. Yeah, you see yeah, the city through my, in, in the through my beard? Oh, that's incredible. There's a hole in your face. <laughs> if I show... Oh, I'm <laughs> it was a pimple, but it popped. And you know what? You're, <laughs> you're sort of ghosty. Your shirt's very ghosty. Yeah. If I ever want to... Because it's not to... quite green. Right. So now for Halloween, if I, if I borrowed that, I could be a ghost. You so now you know what you would look pimple. like with a soul patch. Because you, you know, can see the black. green soul patch. <laughs> Thank you. As he just kind of vanishes. <laughs> there you go. So there, you that just much, satisfies Prince. some curiosity. Indulgent. And over your shoulder, I see we're about uh, probably about 90% complete our rendering process. That looks good. There it is. Looks like we creeped out the, the chat room. Yeah, that did it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's literally almost here. Now, I see you had a question up on your screen. You want to read that one yeah, to me real so, quick? Yeah, um, so we have a question from almost Dennis Kelly. Hey, Dennis. I remember, I always answer your questions, yes. Nice. So do, you, so do you know how to check my Wi-Fi single strength from the command line? Your signal strength on your Wi-Fi from the Linux command line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually uh, surprisingly simple. I don't have Wi-Fi on here. Um, but what you can do, well, I'll tell you, you can actually, and this is finished rendering, so I'm like, oh yeah, this is ready to go. Okay, there in proc slash net, there is a file called wireless, and it's not really a file, it's proc. So if you go, uh, say, cat space slash proc slash net slash wireless, enter, you're going to get output of your wireless card. That's cool, and that'll give you everything. Um, if you type IWList and then the name of your wireless LAN adapter, so WLAN0, for example, uh, so IWList space WLAN0 space scan, then you're going to get a real-time report as well, and you might have to be super user in order to do that. Hope that helps. Okay, we are just about out of time here, folks, but let's do this. This is finished rendering. What do you think is going to happen here? I have no idea. There it is. MySlide.mov. Ready for it? Ooh, look at that smooth. Beautiful. Nice pixels. That actually made it look much, much better. So there you have it, folks. That's the full effect. With a rushed, rushed job, I might add. You're going to take a little bit more time around the hair and things like that. <laughs> Maybe we'd add some translucency. But as far as the effect goes, we've been successful in creating something that's really, really cool with all free software, and it gives us that kind of dimension uh, to the photo as we're moving through our slideshow. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, everybody. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Erica Long. It's 
been nice having you here. Join us next week as uh, Sasha Dermatis is going to be here on the co-host desk. Yay! Yay. It up. It'll be me, part three. That's We're right. We're going to finish it up with uh, showing you how to actually create the transitions and create a final Woo-hoo. product as well. So that's it for us for tonight. For this week, everybody will be here again, every, well, Tuesday night, every Tuesday, Tuesday night. night. But Wait, we're more. your Tuesday night special. Yeah, uh, Tech Tuesday, as uh, as we've been called as of Tech late. Tuesday. So. Tech Tuesday. Tech Join Tuesday. us for Tech Tuesday. <laughs> Hope you can. And so. have a happy St. Patty's Day to everyone. We <laughs> <laughs> Have a wonderful week, everybody. Have happy St. Patrick's Day. Have a wonderful week, too. See ya. Bye. We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.